Thank you, and I'm really glad to be here. I used to go here, but I'm not going to say what year because that would date me too easily. Um, I'm going to devote my first part of the talk to vaping, what it is, why it's harmful, why you shouldn't do it. But then the why not part of my talk is going to be about what students, especially here, can do to shape what the government does next on things like vaping. A, why you're so important, why you have the information that the government needs, but what are the tools and mechanisms to engage the government and get them to listen to you. So I'm going to start briefly by talking about what vaping is and give you a bunch of reasons for why it's terrible, and hopefully you already know this, but if not. Um, vaping is basically heating up liquid nicotine. Um, it's a solution that's, the solvent is probably glycol and vegetable glycerin, there's nicotine and there's flavors. Use a battery to heat it up, it condenses, it turns into an aerosol and condenses into a vapor. Why it was legalized is in part because for a smoker, it's maybe a less harmful way of taking in nicotine. As I'm going to explain in a moment, less harmful than tobacco isn't saying very much, but it is. In tobacco, most of the cancer-causing chemicals are in the tobacco leaves and from combustion, which means literally lighting it on fire. So when you light it on fire, you release carcinogens. Vaping is less harmful because it's nicotine without the tobacco, and you're heating it, you're not burning it. So there are fewer and less carcinogens at lower levels, which means if you're smoking 20 cigarettes a day and you switch completely to vaping product, you're probably getting less chem uh, harmful chemicals into you. However, for everybody else, it's a really bad thing. Um, and saying it's less harmful than tobacco isn't very helpful. because Tobacco, as many of you know, is one of the most harmful things you can do to yourself. You're probably aware of the statistics, but just to let you know, one in two long-term tobacco users will die, about 45,000 deaths a year. There's 70 carcinogens in tobacco smoke and about at least 40 chronic diseases that are causally linked to tobacco. So saying it's less harmful than tobacco is literally saying it's less harmful than the most the leading preventable cause of death and disease in Canada. Um, why is this still harmful? Three things. One is some of the chemicals that are in there. Second is the nicotine and the nicotine addiction, which I'll go into in a second. And then thirdly, um, the unknowns. The chemicals, when you heat up the chemical composition I just mentioned, there's still breakdown products, like formaldehyde. They're still carcinogenic. It's lower than if you're smoking a cigarette, but if you're not smoking a cigarette, that doesn't do you any good. You're still taking in carcinogens. Um, there's contaminants. You're heating something in a metal device with metal coils. There's aluminum, there's nickel, there's other metals that are getting into your system. All of those are linked to health and, and chronic disease problems. Um, you're inhaling a solvent that wasn't meant to be inhaled, and you're doing it many times a day over weeks. And as many of you have read recently, that can affect your lungs, it can create irritation, and if it's the wrong kind of chemical, wrong kind of chemical composition, you start cre creating damage to your lungs. Um, plus, there's a bunch of unknowns. It's a new technology. It's a relatively uncontrolled device in terms of what people are putting in there. So we don't know what happens 10, 15, 20 years from now if you use it regularly. The other, well, another major problem is the nicotine itself. Nicotine is the addictive drug in tobacco. But it's not like caffeine. It's more like amphetamine. What I mean by that is every drug of addiction that we make illegal activates a chemical called dopamine and a system in your brain that mediates both the rewarding effects of a drug and the long-term development of a compulsion and a loss of control over drug seeking. Opioids activates this indirectly. Relaxants like Valium activates this indirectly, so does alcohol. But stimulants like amphetamine, cocaine, and nicotine activate dopamine directly. And like amphetamine, nicotine directly increases the release of dopamine. So it creates a short-term pleasure, but it creates that long-term wiring or rewiring of your brain that leads to a habit turning into a compulsion. And that compulsion means you're taking it even if you don't want to take it. You're taking it knowing that it's harmful to you, and you're trying to miss other things that you should be doing because you want to take it. And that's how you know you have a dependency or how you have an addiction. So these are some of the terrible things that um, vaping can do. And it, shouldn't be confused for anything that constitutes a health product or a health benefit because it's not. It simply exists because um, for smokers, there's something even more harmful out there that they're addicted to, and this is a less harmful way to take in the nicotine if you switch completely to a vaping product. 
So, as you know, there's a lot of headlines out there in terms of the harms and the risks. And the government is trying to decide what to do next. And why youth and students play such an important role is because you have the information that's needed to decide what to do next. Let's see if I can cut the reverb. Um, the cannabis laws, the vaping laws, the tobacco laws, their principal objective is protecting youth or preventing youth from harm or inducements. When the government makes these rules, they consult and engage with youth, but youth often are not organized in a cohesive group to create that body that the government can go to. I'll give you an example. About three and a half years ago, May 31st, 2016, the federal government launched a consultation on tobacco plain packaging. They did it at Lisgar High School, which is not too far from here. Lisgar had organized a weekly or bi-weekly group that discussed public health issues. This got the attention of Minister Philpott and the government, so they launched the consultation at the Lisgar Collegiate Library. There was national and international press there. They filmed the students talking to the minister in one section of the library. The minister literally walked over to the other section and held a press conference announcing Canada's uh, intention to move forward with this initiative. Whenever the federal government wants to know what to do next, it often is making decisions, not necessarily getting first-hand knowledge of what will work with youth. And this is where it's very important, a group to get Ashbury, where you are the target population, but you're also educated, interested, and you're very socially aware, as evidenced by this event you're hosting. You're very active. And you're also physically very close to the people making the decisions. Every law, every policy that the government introduces has to go through something called a public consultation. They literally have to they put online a set of questions and a document, and you get to respond and reply to what they're proposing. They will also meet you in person. If you reach out to them, they will be happy to meet you. And I'm going to send some uh, materials and link to your organizers after this, both to uh, find those consultations, but also how do you approach the people who are making these rules in cannabis and tobacco and vaping. Um, they want to launch public health campaigns to prevent kids from trying vaping products or getting used to vaping products. What are you seeing? What do you know? What do you think will work with students? This is the information that you have that other people don't. And you're ver it's very powerful information because often when you're sitting in an office a few miles away trying to figure out why are youth attracted to these products, you're reading articles, you're trying to get a sense from the media, but you're not always talking to the people who know or who are experiencing, whose friends are experiencing, and can tell you this is why. These flavors are attractive. People are doing it here at these parties because this is why it's appealing. They're getting it from their friends. They're getting it because it's cheap. They're getting it because they have a mistaken sense of how, that it's harmless, or it's less harmful than other drugs, which it's not. So these are all important pieces of information that the government needs, but they also helps inform what tools should they ban flavors? Should they reduce the advertising? Should they reduce certain kinds of advertising? Should they standardize their product? Should they make it only available if you had a prescription from a doctor? These are all recommendations that you can make to the government, and you're well positioned to make those recommendations. So basically, the, the point I want to leave with you is, when we talk about why not, the question should be, why not play a role in where the country goes next? Because you are very well positioned to directly influence where the country goes next on this issue. And if you engage in these public consultations, if you organize yourself in a group and you start to meet with the, the people, they will return the favor and they will meet with you. They will want to hear what you have to say. And in a very direct, real way, you can shape where the government goes next. So it's good to talk about these and it's good to raise awareness. But believe it or not, you're a lot closer to the decisions that are being made than you think. So I'm going to leave it on that note and I'm going to as I said, give some information to your organizers to help you, dis help you familiarize, familiarize yourself with some of the tools to engage with the government and help them, help them get a better sense of where to go next. Uh, thank you very much.